Welcome back <laughs> after a little bit of technical difficulties. So tonight we're going to take you on a brief tour, entertain questions, and show you some jewels from our collection. But first we're going to start with the why here and why now. So it's 2016 at Boston Public Library. Why transfer and offer it today? Sure, so 2016 uh, is the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's uh, death. Uh, institutions all around the world are holding uh, exhibitions, including on programming. Um, it just so happens that the Boston Public Library is particularly well suited for this uh, because we have one of the finest uh, collections of rare and early uh, Shakespeare editions in the world. And people may be surprised to learn that Boston Public Library holds close to a quarter million rare books and over a million manuscripts, and we are in fact in an urban environment <laughs> in downtown Boston, if you can hear that in the background, um, pardon that interruption. And one of the exciting things we're showing you here tonight are all of these materials which are held in the public trust on public display. And so we thought we'd start, Jay, with perhaps something that people might find surprising in the Boston Public Library's collection, um, one, of the, one of the crown jewels. Sure, so scholars come here from all around the world to consult these books, but we don't get to put them on exhibition all the time. And so this allows people to kind of get up close and look at some of the things that are very rarely put on display. And we have a great example uh, right here. Um, maybe one of the most iconic rare books in the world in that it's a book that has kind of made its way over into popular culture. Um, right here on the top, we are looking at uh, the first folio of William Shakespeare. Um, what that means is that this is basically, it's the first because it's the first collected edition of Shakespeare's plays, printed in 1623, seven years after his death. And that term folio, that kind of gets thrown around a lot, uh, basically refers uh, to simplify it to the format of the book. You'll see that this is a large sort of encyclopedia shaped book. People may recognize that portrait. Sure, so this is, I mean, this is a book represents a first in many ways, uh, but this portrait in particular is an important first uh, because this is really the only image of Shakespeare um, that people who knew Shakespeare during his lifetime have attested to it being a representation of him. There are a lot of other portraits one might see around. A couple of them have very good claims to be of Shakespeare, but none of them have that sort of so, it's been said by many, including you, that this is the most important book in English literature, and that's a big claim. So why? What, what sets this apart? Uh, it is a big claim, but I think it's a, it's a sustainable claim. Um, the fact is um, that many of the plays that were on the stage in general during Shakespeare's lifetime are now lost. They no longer survive. Um, this book, sort of containing essentially the first edition of half of Shakespeare's plays. If it hadn't been printed, it's entirely possible that all those plays would have been lost. So for instance, the first folio is essentially the first edition of Macbeth. Without the first folio, there might be no Macbeth. It's the first edition of Julius Caesar. Without the first folio, we would have no friends, Romans, countrymen. Uh, As You Like It might be lost. Uh, and all these other plays, the point is that um, had this book not been produced, Shakespeare would essentially be half the playwright he sees today. <laughs> we probably wouldn't be here celebrating the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. We'd probably be just as likely to be talking about the 400th anniversary of Ben Jonson's first collected edition. And one of the exciting things for Boston Public Library is not only holding this collection, which we'll talk about in a minute, but we've done some really wonderful work around digitizing this collection as well. So not only seeing it in the right. physical form. So you'll see here, all of the books in this exhibition are available free uh, to the public and are easily accessible online. Here we're looking at an image of that first edition of Julius Caesar in the first folio, um, and you can scroll through the entire book, and I think we'll have a link up to this uh, while we're speaking. Um, so we've done a lot not just to make these things accessible in this room, but all around the world. Fantastic. And so how many copies of this survive? Uh, there are about 235 copies of the first folio around the world. Um, the BPL's copy is a particularly good copy. It's in excellent condition, and that's because of where we got the book. We got the first folio, and almost every other book, not only in this exhibition, but in our Shakespeare collection, from 
a very important and kind of overlooked historical figure uh, whose name was Thomas Pennant Barton. Uh, we bought this entire collection from his widow four years after he died in 1873. Uh, the library purchased it for $34,000, uh, which was a pretty, a pretty good bargain, a fraction of the price even at that point, uh, but that was $34,000. Uh, uh, for a collection that today is literally uh, priceless. So we're looking at the first folio, and the, the works that we see here are also from his collection. All of these folios? Every single book here uh, is from Thomas Pennant Barton's collection, and we see below the first folio a number of the later editions of his collected works, which over time sort of moved further and further away, um, if you will, from the sort of the original printings of his texts. So Jay, you talked about the first folio being printed in 1623, but we're celebrating 1616, which is when he died. So if that's published seven years after his death, are there works that were published during his life that are significant as sure. part of this collection? Sure, so um, there were. During Shakespeare's lifetime, his plays would have been printed in a much different format, a format called Porto, um, which essentially would seem to modern readers to be like a pamphlet. They were much smaller books. They were ephemeral, just to say they weren't necessarily made to last, um, and they're very rare for this reason. Um, the sort of big difference is that we think of the text in the first folio for various reasons as being more or less authoritative, or as close to that as we can get. The text in the individual portos often differed from one another. first published in 1603, um, and Hamlet is a great example of these early quarto editions differing from one another. Um, first printed in 1603, however, that first edition was lost for over 200 years. It wasn't rediscovered until 1823. It was found in a closet. Um, at that point, it was quite a find. <laughs> yeah, it was quite a find. Um, at that point, Hamlet had, had sort of long since become what it is today, a sort of iconic piece of English literature. To be or not to be. Um, to be or not to be. Uh, this is kind of the most symbolic uh, of the differences. But those first two editions differed radically. And in fact, was when they pulled the first edition out of that closet in 1823, it was unrecognizable in a way. And it, it seemed like Hamlet, characters were different, their names were different, the plots were different. And the famous line, to be or not to be, that That's was the, the question. question. The most iconic right. line in the English language was to be or not to be. Either is the point. Okay, that's shocking. And was that, that must have been shocking when it was discovered. That was shocking when it was discovered. It sort of certainly caused kind of a literary scandal. And the question was, what does that mean and how do we interpret that? Is, is that first edition what Shakespeare really wrote and the second edition isn't? Was that a pirated version? Was that an adaptation? Perhaps Shakespeare wrote both of them. And the answer to that question uh, over time <laughs> has kind of affected the way that critics and eventually um, normal people read the books. So we're asking which is the authoritative version, and there's still a lot of conversations happening around that. What we're looking at here are the two examples, uh, the 1603 and the 1604 editions are interesting, and those are facsimile versions of those early quartos. What I think is even more interesting and important about the BPL's collection You've talked a lot um, in tours and throughout this exhibition about this concept of lifetime quarto and why that's even more significant. What does that mean? Sure, so Shakespeare died in 1616. Mm -hmm. That first folio was printed seven years after his yep. death. But those plays that were printed during Shakespeare's lifetime uh, are from essentially the early 1590s until 1616, are referred to as lifetime quartos. Uh, these are extremely Okay, when you say extremely <laughs> rare, what does that mean? Uh, to give you uh, an example, um, over 200 copies of the first folio. When we're talking about lifetime portos, we're talking about a handful of surviving books. And here we have uh, three quarto editions printed during Shakespeare's lifetime and one printed just after. Um, this book up here in the upper right, very tiny, sort of, uh, inconspicuous looking volume is the first edition of A Midsummer Night's Dream. This is printed in 1600. 
Again, it would have been sold without the binding that you see it in, so it would have been very fragile. It would have been read, rolled up in a pocket, maybe taken to the theater, maybe even purchased in the theater. Um, it was not meant to last 416 years. It probably wasn't really even meant to last for one year. And for that reason, these are very, very scarce. Um, we have a fairly substantial collection at the BPL of lifetime quartos. And again, underneath that, you'll see the first edition of Merchant of Venice, also printed in 1600. To put this into perspective, this is a relatively common lifetime quarto as they go. And there's about 18 copies of this in the world, so still enormously rare. Um, we see here very quickly in the lower left the earliest edition of Hamlet at the BPL. This is Hamlet printed in 1611. This is exactly what the play would have looked like to Shakespeare's earliest readers uh, during his lifetime. Is that closer to the 1603 or the 1604 version? The 1611 version is printed almost exactly from the 1604 version. So this would be a Hamlet that is recognizable uh, to everybody. You can open it up and see all the speeches in there. Interesting. Um, so I think we're going to move to our next section. So we <laughs> So you had talked about this notion of authorship. Sure. When one has a, a question about Shakespeare's writing something or not writing something, it, it feels like it's very much attention. Um, but looking at Macbeth, I think it, Macbeth is famous um, to almost everyone as one of the, the most well-known plays. That certainly can't be open to that kind of question, can it? Sure. So there are questions sort of behind all of Shakespeare's work. And the fact is, none of his letters survive, none of his original manuscripts survive, none of his correspondence exists in which he sort of tells us why he wrote, what his process was, um, uh, and what happens is the earliest texts that scholars can get to are these quarto editions, oftentimes. And so we find plays that have differences between them, and we find plays that have been co-written by other authors, perhaps silently. Um, Macbeth sort of runs the full spectrum, uh, which is to say, it's a text, first of all, that Shakespeare took uh, sort of directly from an earlier source. He took the story of Macbeth almost entirely from a book printed in 1587. We have a copy of that book right here. This is a, a, a historical chronicle, just sort of a retelling of British history. It's called the Holland's Head Chronicles. And Shakespeare takes the story from here. He makes it much more poetic, certainly. But you're saying there's a real Macbeth. There's a real Macbeth. Macbeth is a historical figure. And there are a lot of figures in Shakespeare's histories and tragedies that are based on real people. And in most cases, they're sort of more well-known now for their sort of depictions in Shakespeare's plays than they are sort of as historical figures. Um, but in any event, Shakespeare takes this story, makes it very dramatic, adds a lot of suspense. Um, it's first printed in the first folio seven years after his death. And here we have a very early edition from the second folio. The interesting thing here is that Shakespeare's version of Macbeth seems to be lost. Um, that earliest edition um, comes down to us filtered through one of Shakespeare's contemporaries, a playwright named Thomas Middleton, who seems to have revised the play probably just after Shakespeare died. Uh, we know that because there are wordings and phrases that are sort of distinctly associated with Middleton and not Shakespeare. Um, we have a character uh, that Middleton took from one of his own plays called The Witch and sort of plopped it right into Macbeth when he revised it. And we have a couple of songs that he also took from his own play and inserted uh, into his version. And it also seems that he deleted probably something around a thousand lines from Shakespeare's original text. I think people would be very surprised to see Macbeth the musical. So there are two questions that come to mind. One has to do around what copyright or plagiarism meant or didn't mean during this time period. And the second, I think, is a more significant even than that, which is, so is Macbeth really Shakespeare's? Sure. So this wouldn't have been considered plagiarism. This was sort of standard practice in the theater. People were taking other plays, adapting them, sort of rehashing them and changing them around all the time. Shakespeare did that himself on a lot of occasions worked with other playwrights. Plays were very malleable things. They were meant to be performed. They changed from night to night, and their, their texts were constantly shifting. 
to the point where it's very difficult to even know what an original Shakespeare text is or what that would mean. Um, to get to your second point, so we sort of know that Shakespeare wrote the play uh, because most of the text, most of the wording is distinctly associated with him. Um, this is a, a play that probably about 10% of it is written by Middleton, it seems like. And the rest are kind of um, Shakespeare's words, but maybe moved around, maybe edited slightly, but it's certainly a, a Shakespearean play. So this is a common refrain I'm hearing, um, whether you're talking about the folios, whether you're talking about individual plays, that they're the different versions, the different editions, or the different performances all seem to have, well, a common thread, often their own unique input, modifications, edits, changes. Right. Shakespeare really is a beautiful, um, not, well, not person, but the, the words themselves have sure. a very mutable form. Plays were malleable and changeable <laughs> to begin with, and then once you put that into print, there are all sorts of things that happen along the way uh, from the stage uh, to the publishing house that can right. change the text around. Sort of characters to be inserted or removed, they can be censored, and that's sort of in addition to the entire theatrical edition, right. which is constantly changing the plays, so almost from night to night on the stage. And while I wish we had the opportunity to show you everything from the show, there's a wonderful selection of materials from the theater, including a conversation about King Lear with a happy ending, which I found very interesting. Um, publishers and printers get into the mix attributing plays to Shakespeare right. that are not attributed to Shakespeare, attributing two plays, plays to Shakespeare for the first time, where playwrights didn't normally have sure. their names attached. Um, and then all of a sudden we get into this murky <laughs> area. Um, you see this very uh, bold forgery in front of you. Why is it uh, in particular, in the conversation that we're about to have around forgeries, what is it about Shakespeare that particularly invites this particular topic to conversation? Sure, so there are kind of two different threads that kind of go together. One is that for various reasons over time, Shakespeare went from being um, perhaps the most famous or one of the most famous poets and playwrights in England to being a cult sort of the, the epitome of English literature, one of the most famous people in the world, uh, one of the most important writers in the English language. He goes way up on a pedestal. At the same time, there are still no original documents, essentially. There are a few seems... autographs. Seems surprising. It seems <laughs> yeah. I, I can't even find the word. I mean, I think for many people, for someone to be so famous, to have such a lasting, enduring legacy, and so little physically attached to the person, it makes sense that people would want to fill that void. Right, so as he becomes more famous, there's people that are sort of clamoring for answers, and along the way, what happens is people essentially start filling in the gaps in knowledge with their own primary sources. Time and again, um, documents are pulled from trunks that are the first edition of King Lear or a letter from Queen Elizabeth to Shakespeare that answers all kinds of questions that people have, and invariably, they've turned out to be sort of falsified. Um, and the BPL itself uh, was not immune to that process. <laughs> to look at a very interesting example of a book that this library purchased in 1880. Um, this is a copy of Plutarch, and it had in it this little slip that you see in front of you, um, which was thought at the time to be the sixth example of Shakespeare's handwriting in the world. That little sort of scrawled line is supposed to say William Shakespeare, 120 pounds. Um, it caused a sensation. There are newspaper articles from all around the world about the Boston Shakespeare autograph when it was discovered. It was eventually um, debunked. Uh, and the book itself was relatively believable, because this is, this is a book that Shakespeare certainly would have read. He took a lot of the stories from his history plays from this book. The printer of this book, Shakespeare probably knew. So it was a very plausible connection. Um, but sort of forgery has been such a constant thread in Shakespeare's studies, throwing people off the track changing the way we've looked at him, that the world of forgery and falsification has sort of become an area of study unto itself. And that's why we have so many different specimens here at the library.
So I wanted to pause for a moment because we have um, one question that I wanted to share from Trevor Massey. What was the character from Middleton's play, The Witch, that was put into Macbeth? And so, how do you know? So, right. So, there, there's you know, the very famous witch scenes in Macbeth where you've got these three witches who are dancing around the cauldron and sort of setting Macbeth's fate and giving all these prophecies. And then there's this additional witch that sort of shows up in a couple of scenes, Hecate, or Hecate, sort of the, the, the leader of the witches. That is a character that came directly out of Middleton's Macbeth for various reasons. Scholars have sort of pieced together uh, that, I'm, I'm sorry, from Middleton's play, the witch, scholars have sort of pieced together that he wrote that shortly before he revised <coughs> to uh, Macbeth. So you also commented about the music, and there are some interesting musical in Macbeth that are not seen anywhere else either, that come away, for instance. Sure, right. So in all of these plays, there would have probably been more music than we think of now. Even at Shakespeare's, during even, Shakespeare's time. Even, even during Shakespeare's time. And these songs sort of moved from one play to the next. And two of those songs uh, that have that come away song is a great example. Uh, it, its full text appears in The Witch, um, along with an entire second song, which sort of provides this direct um, connection between the two plays. And these connections are sort of bubbling around all throughout this entire exhibition. This is the idea of Shakespeare unauthorized. We're looking at sort of what it means for Shakespeare to be an author if all of his works were changed around in one way or another by a different people. And what's so interesting is that new scholarship continues to bubble up and expand. And, and these volumes are very much part of that work. Sure, so people are coming here consulting these texts changing our understanding of Shakespeare on a daily basis. Uh, and this is sort of one of the many, many different kinds of collections like this that we have um, upstairs in our rare books collections at the museum. So I think that's it for tonight. Again, I'm Beth Franklin of Special Collections, joined by Jay Michelle, curator of rare books and curator of the exhibition, Shakespeare Unauthorized. Again, we'd like to thank Iron Mountain for their generous support in putting on this exhibition. CNG Partners for their fabulous exhibition design, the Associates of the Boston Public Library for their curatorial and conservation support. Again, we encourage you to see this exhibition, which is open through March 31st at the Central Library in Copley Square. Please visit our website at bpl.org Shakespeare, and we hope to see you soon.